Trading Nut, episode 200. So visualization and, or imagery, mental rehearsal, whatever people want to refer to it as, is very powerful because neurologically, the brain cannot recognize the difference between a kind of a mental simulation and a real experience. So at the neurological level, it's the same. Uh, and, and, the, and the way of kind of making sense of that is to think about a nightmare. When you have a nightmare, it's an imagined experience, but you could wake up sweating, feeling the sensations of fear, heart pounding and so on. So, so we can use imagery to our advantage in trading. And, and this is one of my, I guess, what, mental training practices in many ways but it is useful in that way as, as tom utilizes it which and as i would do with my traders in terms of if we know the sorts of situations that we want to kind of be more willing to um, embrace and accept and work with we can rehearse them. the market's going to do something your job is not to fight it the market never ever runs away it's always there that personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax, learn the process. And it looks like pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial trading or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to the 200th episode of the Trading Up podcast. So glad we got here. Can't believe I've done 200 of these since starting Trading Up. Today, we've got Steve Ward on the show. Now, Steve is a trading mindset expert. He's been working with traders for over 17 years. Not just traders, but he's been working with traders at uh, some of the world's largest banks, high-performing hedge funds, asset managers, commodity trading houses, whole lot of other things, proprietary trading firms as well. So guys, if we're in for a treat today and we go over things like the human condition, the behavioral behavior gap, uh, the role of luck, outcome bias, comfort versus discomfort, managing your emotions, and fear of missing out. So guys, that's coming up in the show. Uh, he's also the author of a number of books, so you want to go and check those out. They're all going to be in the show notes. Now, um, we've got a video on the channel this week that you also going to want to check out, which is from Lewis Kelly, who's a past guest. He did a live stream on the show last week, and it was quite a long live stream, but there was some absolute nuggets in there. What we've done is taken those out, put them together in a little video. We're going to see really what drives price and how the markets work from a smart money point of view. So definitely go and check that out, folks, after uh, watching this interview with Steve. Other things happening here on the 200th episode of Trading Out, we've got the Robot Lab Live. We're basically putting the build that we've just been spending the last six, seven weeks on uh, into a demo account to test it over the course of a week. So we've got it looking pretty good uh, from a portfolio point of view. We're going to run this on a... Uh, prop trading firm very soon so if you guys do want to check that out head over there trading nut look for the robots link and you'll find robot lab live you also find robot builders club where i teach you how to pretty much turn your ideas into trading robots without doing any coding whatsoever so go and check that out now before we get into it two more things the scalping challenge it's a, a london scalping challenge uh, I need to I need to hear from you folks. If you are keen, if you trade the London session, if you think you're pretty good, we're gonna do a bit of a challenge to see who is one of the best scalpers out there for the London Open. Uh, so if you guys are, are scalping the London Open and want to come on the channel, then hit me up, support at tradingnut.com. Uh, you'll find the links over there at tradingnut as well. Now, last but not least, we have confirmed a new sponsor. It's Fidel Crest, and they will be coming on the show very soon. So please go and check them out. I'll put some links uh, in the show notes description. They'll be over there on tradingnut.com as well. So please go and check them out. Give them a well warm welcome all right folks here we are episode 200 let's get on with it all right folks here we are on trading up we've got steve ward in the house uh steve is a trading mindset expert and i'm going to let you tell us all about your background and how you got to doing what you do um but i was reckon you were recommended by tom hugard who came on the show and we just said that this epically long but yet fantastic episode where he dove into a lot of mindset stuff so he recommended you so i can only imagine that it's going to be like 10 times better than than um what we got was with with, uh, with tom probably not i mean that was that was pretty awesome so if it is that's fantastic but do you want to start off with um telling the guys a little bit about how you got into what you do now and and uh, um i know it's quite a fascinating story yeah sure so 
my initial work in in the world of psychology was a, as a sports psychology coach so i was working with athletes and teams elite level so olympians international athletes teams in about 33 different sports all over the globe did that for a number of years and then just really through a random encounter uh with somebody on a on a, a sports psychology course was asked to come and see if i could um provide sports psychology coaching but to improve trading performance. This was about February 2005, so quite a long time ago now. And the, the basic background from their side was they were very forward thinking. They had a, a, um, someone in house who was a sort of the head of performance. He was an ex-professional tennis player. He was looking at what they, what they were doing around trading performance. And they helped. They had, they had great setup, great systems, beautiful office, uh, in-house cafeteria, serving healthy food, all, all the things that you could imagine it would be useful what he observed was they spent a lot of time talking about things like confidence, anxiety, worry, fear, stress, pressure, but they were doing nothing to train it or develop it. Uh, and obviously coming from, a, from an elite tennis background, he could see that was an obvious gap uh, in performance. So uh, we met, had a few conversations. And then basically invited me in. We ran some workshops for the for the traders. Initially, I guess, with a, a sports slash performance slant. And then we had to try and, I guess, translate that into um, trading uh, context. I had, at this point, I had literally zero knowledge or experience of, of trading at all. So uh, it was very fresh for me. Uh, and in the end, I was asked to, to work there uh, on a contract three days a week. So I did that for about a year. That gave me more time then to, to learn about trading, to sit in on the, on the grad training program, do some trading myself. Um, and yeah, then develop things, I guess, more specialized and, and more specific. And then really from, from then onwards, I think the last bit of sports work I did was probably the Winter Olympics 2006. And since then, it's all been um, trading, investing related. So clients now are prop trading groups, commodities trading houses, banks, hedge funds, asset managers, energy trading firms, really the whole spectrum. Again, all over the world, generally from sort of, I guess, the graduate to new traders all the way through to some of my clients who are uh yeah it's sort of the market wizard level um you know real high level elite traders mm. um whole spectrum so it um uh, and then somewhere in the middle of that i also got the chance to do a bit of work with professional poker players on the european pro tour which was a again it's a it's a yeah. nice um insight into a related field high performance probabilistic decision making risk taking but with obviously a, a slightly different lens to, to view it from yeah. and, and what did you find um uh, easiest to find results and was it trading poker or sports uh, I think well I, I think none of them is easy to find results in that's for sure I think trading for me I find more complicated I think there's a lot more there's a lot high level of uncontrollability you know it's very rarely the same if you're a swimmer and you turn up to a swimming event the pool's going to probably be 50 meters uh, eight lanes long the lanes are the same width you know you've got standardized lane ropes you're going to swim, if it's a 50 metre butterfly, you're going to swim 50 metres butterfly. You're not going to swim 47.2 metres of front crawl. So there's a, you know, in some events, track cycling, swimming, there's a high level of controllability. Athletes who I was working with had very common challenges, almost not methodical, but there was almost like a formula when people came to you, you could kind of work out pretty easily what you needed to do. Um, what I found out in trading particularly was, there's a whole number of reasons that can be going on at any given time why a trader may or may not have made you know a good decision or not. So, I, and I still find that really intriguing, just the amount of forces that are being applied at any given time that might sway us one way or the other. So, mm. um, I mean, I've been doing it 17 and a half years plus now, uh, and, and I still find it you know probably out of the three areas, I still find it the most fascinating and intriguing. Right, and and so I mean, like, I've actually had quite a few traders on the show that have use sports as like a sort of way to make their trading successful how yeah. did you how did you sort of tweak what you were doing with this in the sporting world for the trading world to, to make it relevant and where did you see the commonalities lie so i think for me what was useful was at the time a lot of the traders i was working with initially a large proportion either had come from a sporting background or had an interest in sports so there was a a relatability, a connection that, that kind of made it easier for me. But I think themes around, I mean, obviously competition, particularly for the, for the younger guys I was working with early on, that was really important. Things like confidence, I think is a, a theme across all high performance. 
then concentration, focus versus distractibility, resiliency, particularly, you know, how do I deal with things when they're not going well? That's obviously a very important skill in trading where you, you know you could be losing um, or some of my best traders are losing around half of the time. So so I think they're probably some of the key themes that are really important. Outside of that, I'm also a big proponent of of lifestyle. So the physiology, how we look after ourselves. And again, that has a high level of relatability, I think, early on. So sort of a, a mind-body approach to to improving trading performance. Um, but then trading, it isn't a sport because it is, you know, I mean, sport, often you have a season and an off season. You know when the match is going to be played. You know that that's the moment you've got to prepare for. So trading's not like that. Trading's like this ongoing competition, um, or, almost 24-7 for some people. Yeah. So, And we don't know when you're going to have to really you know, when it's going to be quieter or busier, when it's going to be more volatile or less volatile. So I think it's, there's a whole, there are some similarities, maybe in terms of some of the attributes that are, that are useful, but there's a whole world of difference between what's required um, as well. So and that's really, I guess, you know, the last 17 years has me been refining, starting with a base of, let's call it performance psychology, and then building upon that all the skills required for the nuances um, of trading, which also, you know, is about decision-making, under conditions of uncertainty. So that's really what the core of it is all about. And that's where things like behavioral finance have been quite useful. Um, I use a lot of neuroscience um, in there as well. So yeah, so some similarities, but but also very different. Mm. And, and like you say, you're sitting down with a, a new trader, at, let's say they're at a prop firm or something like that. Yep. What would, it be, what would be the first thing that you would be trying to find out from that trader? And how would you go about doing that? Well, the first thing that always interests me um, about anybody doing anything is is why they've chosen to do it. So that's always my starting point. It's kind of what brings you here? Um, what is it you're looking for? Why this and not something else? So that, that's always my first point. And uh, then I mean, I, I, when I meet any of my clients, we normally spend the first hour or two. I'm just curious about, you know, kind of why they're here, um, what brought them here, what was the kind of the path, um, their sort of biography, how they grew up, whether they went to university or if they didn't go there, what they did instead. And that all intrigued me. So kind of people's trajectory to, to, into the markets. Uh, expectations, that was always curious for me. You know, what, how do they expect it to be going forward? And um, the insight I had quite early on was that for most people, the feedback was it was harder than I thought and it took longer than I thought. So people's expectations were, you know, maybe they've come from a sports background or they've played poker or they've been to kind of a really top through a top level academic uh, trajectory. And they have an expectation they'll kind of come into the markets, pick it up pretty quickly, start making money early. Uh, that's very rarely the case uh, for many people. And actually, if they do start making money early, it's often a curse. Uh, it's often one of the worst things that can happen. So, yeah, so I think that, that's kind of my initial, I guess I'm just curious about them as a person initially. Mm. That, that's my key interest. And then we'll maybe get into more, you know, the trading and so on. And then the first stage is really, for me, it's more about um, building competence and building just general skills and knowledge more than the psychology. Um, that probably has a bigger part to play once people start trading live. There's some early, early stage work to be done that's useful, but I think for most people, they don't even understand the, the relevance of psychology mm. until they've been into the markets for a while, made some money, lost some money. And, and is, there, is there any sort of information you need to glean from them other than, you know, trying to get their background in terms of um, giving you a starting point as to like, okay, well, this guy is, you know, let's say on a scale from one to 10, this person is a, is a seven, so they don't need a lot versus this person is a three, they're miles away. Um, is there anything yep. you do or use to, to try and ascertain that? Not well, I don't do a lot of work cam with with newer traders at that level. So by the time I'm seeing someone, if I'm seeing someone for coaching in the last probably 10 years plus, they will have a, they'll be have been in the markets for at least two years. So I don't generally take anybody for coaching who's not got, you know, a good level of market mm. experience. I don't I don't believe that I would add massive value um, up until that point. If I see them in a program somewhere before that, we're probably doing some group training, probably some skills training or just creating some stuff around the process. But the one thing that I do do quite early, which I think it does, which might align to your question, is we will do some psychometric testing and we'll look at people's personality profiles. And then we'll utilize that for two, two reasons. One is to enable them to get a bit more insight into who they are and what their preferences might be. But also so that, so that as they're moving through their developmental stages early on, we can start to maybe shape the markets that, we, that they're put into 
and it might also help us to shape the approaches and their strategy so that they align with their personality preferences. So um, for a lot of people, that's very much trial and error. Um, I think the, the danger for some people is, particularly in the retail world, they gravitate towards a person, a, you know, a well-known coach or mentor, and they try to learn it their way, which would be like you know, everybody gravitating towards you know, someone like, say, Usain Bolt, keep it simple, and we all want to be sprinters. The reality is we're not all going to be great sprinters, and there might be somebody else somewhere else, you know, Mo Farah in the marathon camp, where some of us went over to him, we would do significantly better. So we're not all going to be able to trade in the way that the you know a, a certain mentor is going to be and this is true institutionally so if we can understand those preferences and where our strengths are and where our interests are and our values and all those things align it can help us to maybe earlier on get people onto sort of the right track therefore increasing chances of success right and, and just as a bit of a sort of side note i mean have you had like i mean you're obviously dealing with guys who have been you know trading for a while um they, they've got you know i'm guessing most of them are have either been profitable or are profitable traders you know because they're, they're, they're doing it for a living um what's the biggest success story you've had in what you've done where you've sort of come away going man i've you know this is something that this guy i saw him he was in this this position and after working with the person for, or, the, or even the firm perhaps, for X number of months, years, you've managed to get them to achieve this. Have you, have you got any sort of good success stories like that? Um, well, thankfully, I've got a, a number. I mean, I can't share them in too much detail. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. Um, I've actually had a guy recently, last year, hedge fund guy, uh, young trader, young hedge fund trader. Um, and he's... And it ties into the personality thing because he's been struggling to kind of find his way of, of, of trading. And he's had a, a senior PM working with him and they've got opposing styles. So he's trying to find his way and he's got a particular way of trading that he likes to, to do and where he's best. But it doesn't align with what his senior PM thinks he should be doing. So they've been having this conflict ongoing. Anyway, during the first part of the coaching we managed to get enough confidence in, in, the, in the trader I was coaching to, to really to do it his way and, and take that leap of faith and just do it your way, you know, and then see what happens. And that got good results early on. Therefore, we got a bit more buy-in from the senior PM. He had a number for the year he wanted to make, which was a, which was a good number, uh, which he, he, he did multiple um, Xs of. Um, predominantly as a result of just really trusting in himself being himself not trying to be somebody else but having the confidence to do it in his own way this year he's continued to grow from that obviously we've had some interesting uh, market conditions he in his mind has got a number i can't say what it is but where he sees the very best of the best operate and he at the moment is a very small margin away from achieving that this year. And it, again, it's multiples of multiples of what he made last year. Okay. Um, and again, that's been this increasing confidence and growth in who he is and doing things as, as he would do them. Um, and and a, a really strong commitment to developing himself as a trader. So m- as much as we're seeing the, the, the exponential growth in P&L, embedded into that is a lot of hard work you know kind of really being curious about him how he does what he does how to do it better doing the work um so yes yeah, so that's probably been a, a top and tail that, that are two interesting stories so hey folks ever wonder what broker i use well i use hanko trade it was a no-brainer because i was looking for a broker with good trading conditions and one that wouldn't restrict my leverage now by joining hanko trade i've also cut down my trading costs significantly with their super low commission of just one dollar per 100k you can learn more at hankotrade.com or just click the link i've put in the description are you able to tell us what sort of fundamental things you were able to Im- implement that helped make the shift for that trader yeah well i mean there's, there's a drawdown is is um is a term that's common for all traders so everyone kind of knows what it is and probably everyone's been through it and everyone experiences it in different ways and for different reasons. So one observation, I mean, I often get asked by people, you know, kind of what's the formula for getting through drawdown or what's the formula for, you know, holding winning trades for longer. There are some commonalities, but everybody's unique. So, the, you know, when we experience something in the markets, we're experiencing the same phenomena, but for different reasons and in different ways. But I mean, some of the things I'll always come back down to are, first of all, you've got to accept the situation you're in. You know, so if you're losing money, there's no point trying to deny the fact you're losing money and there's no point being in a situation where you're just languishing and hoping that you're going to start making money again soon. 
So it has to be kind of an ac- a, a realistic acceptance of the situation. That's my starting point. You don't want to be here. You know, it could be pretty dreadful, but this is where you're at. So that, that is the anchoring point. They may have already done, and if not, we might do. Or the question I would ask is, what changed? So we do some reflection. Because if you were making money and now you're not, and it's outside of the, the normal range, the question is, well, what's changed? And it can only be two things, really, in simple terms. Either the market conditions have changed, which it is probably in nine times out of 10 situations, or they've changed. They're doing something differently, or it's a combination of both. So we want to get some insights into maybe what has changed, because that will then determine, in terms of action going forward, what we might need to do. Is it work with the trader? Is it work around you know, them internally? Is it work around adjusting what they're doing to the market conditions? On top of that, we've also got to help them to kind of deal with the, um, the confidence slash resiliency of getting through um, the tough period. And that varies, again, for different people. Some people are, are pretty good at getting through these situations. Other people are less so. But the things that I'd be looking at is, you know, can we, once we've accepted a situation, can we see it in a more useful way? So could this be, it's not going to be a period of, of, um, of earning potentially, but it could be a period of learning and reflection. In fact, I would say for most traders, the majority of learning and development is done when they are in drawdown or having setbacks. Very little learning and development goes on when traders are doing well and making money. They're just too busy just carrying on, hoping they're going to, going to keep making money. So it's a really key period where traders can improve themselves, make their process more robust, make them more robust. Um, it might be they're having particular thoughts and emotions that are showing up that might be troublesome. So we'd obviously want to do some work around how we do that. But we're always keeping the baseline is, What's the behavior that you need to do in this moment or today or tomorrow that's going to be effective in moving you forward? Uh, and that's the key. So, again, it's like, a, you know, each a drawdown is, is a contextual shift. When you're making money, it's one context. So behaviors that are useful are different to when you're in drawdown. So we've always got to be thinking about, right, in drawdown, what's important? What do I need to focus on? What do I need to be doing moment to moment, day to day? And we've got to keep the focus on that. And then what happens for many people is, even if they know that, it's the thoughts and emotions that are showing up are getting in their way. So we've got to be clear about what we're doing and be managing the experience around that so that we can keep doing what we're doing ongoing, which for some people, just down to the nature of the drawdown, could be for a significant period of time. I mean, I've had traders go through drawdown for you know, getting close to a year and, and in some cases probably beyond before they come out of it fully. So that's tough. Mm. That's yeah. really tough. Yeah. It's, t- it's tough for a month. And was this trader's uh, particular drawdown, and we'll, we'll sort of move on after this, was it due to the market having changed or was it ex- other external factors? Market changed followed by his an unhelpful reaction on his side to try to correct it. Um, right. Right. So, so, the, and this is this is a key thing, you know. The, the a market change or any kind of event that's market driven is outside the trader's control. Hmm. So, all the trader can control is how do I respond to, and I use that word intentionally as opposed to react. So, how do I respond to the events that are going on in the market? And over time, what I'm trying to do with my clients is essentially a bit build like a playbook of in all the different scenarios you might find yourself in in the market. We want a playbook for responding effectively that suits you as an individual in that situation. Mm. So that as they progress through their career, whether they are having, you know, a a long extended winning period can be equally as dangerous as a long extended losing period. You need a playbook for both. Uh, When volatility suddenly increases, what's the playbook? You know, what are you going to do that's right for you in that situation? It's going to be different for all people, but each individual trader needs to think about the context they're going to encounter in the, in the markets and what their own individual response is going to be to that in terms of behavior, what thoughts might show up, how I'm going to manage those, what emotions might show up, how I'm going to manage those, and so on. So, And I think that's what experience gives you, providing you have that experience is um, combined with intentional reflection and development. Mm. And, and I suspect that's why people reach out to the likes of you to to try and get that external view on what they're doing because they just can't see you can't see the wood for the trees you know if you're at the coal face right yeah it's difficult sometimes you know there's a there's a lot going on and, and the reality of trading as well um ironically and some of my clients sit on trading floors of another 150 to 200 people 
is it can be very lonely. So when, when you're having a really tough time, you know, I've got most of, I would say probably most of my clients won't be talking to their partners at home about it. They won't want to be talking to friends outside of their trading social network about it. Very often, they don't want to talk to their friends within their trading network about it. So, that, so a lot of people don't have um, a person who understands what they do and the challenges and who they can open up and say, and this is how I'm feeling about it. This is, this, you know, I'm struggling with this or I need some help with this. Um, it's getting easier for people as certainly from 2005 to now. Um, it's a lot, there's probably more people available, but trading inherently is still quite a, a lonely um, occupation for many mm. people. So yeah. it, um, yeah, so so reaching out to someone like yourself is is a way forward. Now, um, let's, let's, let's we've had a few examples of individuals and you know how uh, people you've dealt with have overcome their you know trading psychology and mindset issues. Let's dive in a little bit more around sort of the general approach of you know trading uh, mindset issues and how to resolve them and why we have them. And maybe starting off with like for example the human condition and what is wrong with us and why can't normal human. Uh, behaviors or emotions help us be successful in the markets from the from the outset well nothing's wrong with us i think that's the starting point uh we, you know all humans are fallible i think george soros you know talks about fallibility so you know we're all fallible um and I, but, but 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 we're humans i think i think the starting point is we have we have to accept the fact that we are human uh, and there are some great things about that um, and of course, for anything that's great, there are some challenges to that as well, which we have to learn to, to manage and navigate. So human condition really is about the, um, the events and circumstances happen to us in, in sort of the, the journey of life. So we're born, at the end we die, and there's all the stuff that goes on in between that. Learning, highs, lows, good, bad, emotions, thoughts, sensations in a body, all of that is part of that human condition which essentially we could also kind of, I guess, micro package into probably the trading condition, which is, uh, you know, there's a, I start trading the birth of me as a trader. At some point I give up trading the death of me as a trader as such. And then there's all the highs, lows, emotions, thoughts that come with that. What happens in the um, trading condition, particularly as a reflection of human condition is that when we are taking risk under conditions of uncertainty, often many of the ways in which we, would want to think that would be useful for us may not be what comes natural as part of the human condition. So for us in evolutionary terms to survive and to thrive, we also adapt to ways of thinking and feeling that biologically primed are, are useful for us. And often lots of those core you know, instincts um, and behaviors are not the same ones that are going to be helpful for us in the markets. And that's what I think behavioral finance and behavioral economics has really kind of been useful in helping us kind of to, to understand. Um, so what it means is, uh, much as in life, as we go through life as humans, people need to shape how they think to perform well in their, you know, as, as partners, as sons, parents, uh, in our roles. In trading, we have to do the same thing. You know, as you go into the markets, you're bringing in your current set of beliefs, your, you know, your mindset, and how you do things. And some of those actually based on your prior experiences. So I've had a, one trader I worked with, a young trader who was a phenomenal trader from a very early part, had played chess to a high level as a youngster and had played poker uh, through university to a very high level. And what happened was as he came into the markets, that shaping in his early, in the early life from his two different tracks had enabled him to come into the markets with a mindset that already enabled him to understand lots of what was required for success was kind of already in place. Other people are coming in with none of that at all. So we're all going to come into it, not just as humans, but as different humans. So we're going to find some things easier and or harder. But then as we go through the markets, the goal is to really start to understand yourself as a risk taker and decision maker under these conditions of uncertainty. And then to try and, I guess, grasp hold of some of the common themes and um, approaches that can be useful for all people, but also to understand your more individual nuances. And essentially, the goal is to shape a mindset and a set of behaviors that enables you to perform well under market conditions. And there'll be some commonalities and some differences uh, amongst people um, as, as you go about doing that. Okay, okay. I think I think that sort of, that answers the question. Now, interesting. You say somebody who plays chess 
were from a young age was able to be quite successful. I mean, I've heard that before. With it. there's a, there was another podcaster, um, quite a famous podcaster. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but anyway, he was a chess sort of genius when he was a kid. Ended up working for a hedge fund, then like became sort of semi famous and started podcasting. What 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 do you think it is about people being very good at chess that allows them to be a you know have a better chance of being successful at trading? I'm not saying chess per se, um, but I think you know chess is a strategic thinking game where often you're also thinking about one, two, three moves ahead of the game, so not just what's going to happen right now. But I think that the, the idea of strategy of thinking ahead, you know, if you're playing against another person, you're trying to understand that person and what they might do. If I do this, what are they uh, thinking? Yeah, they yeah, might yeah. do this, and what right. will I do in response? Well, if you think about it in the markets. Yeah. And I think Paul Tudor Jones talks about this a lot. You know, if you think about the markets as a collection of people, and if you know, if 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 the market is thinking this, what will the market do? Not just here's what I want to do with my strategy, but you know, who else is in the market? How are they thinking about price? And if they're thinking about price like this, how are they feeling? If they're feeling this, what might they do? And therefore, where will price go? And what does that mean for me? So I think once you get into that type of thinking, that's really useful. But you know, chess is a it's a, it's a cognitive thinking strategy game, you know, which I think if you align it into some forms of trading, gives you an edge. Um, some traders don't need to be super strategic. Some traders are very feel based. Um, so that, so I don't think all chess players make great traders, but I think chess can give you some skills that will enable you to be yeah. a good trader. But chess combined with poker, which is a risk taking game where you're making decisions, and there is some uncertainty and you're thinking about probability and essentially in poker, you're losing a lot. And this is one of my key insights is what poker players are good at is they're good at losing or good poker players are good at losing. Yeah. They're good losers. Yeah. And this will tie into what, you know, what Tom talks about with his book and, and I'm sure it came out in the podcast about, you know, the, you know, the best loser wins. You've got to be good at losing. And in fact, I was literally having a conversation yesterday uh, with a, with a hedge fund client and um, we been together uh, with some other people from the firm on an offsite recently and he was saying about how it was interesting that lots of people he was talking to on the offsite um, colleagues of his who would come from um, high level sports backgrounds or those that have played poker his insight yesterday as we were talking about dealing with losses was they had an advantage because they'd had years and years and years of be- of learning how mm. to lose how to deal with the loss and how to kind of get back in the game after the loss. And, yeah. he, and he, he kind of had this realization that having not come from a poker or a sports background, if he could have changed something about his life, that's one thing he would like to have had was that opportunity to learn how to be a good loser before getting into the market. Yeah. So I think, you know, chess, poker combination is quite interesting. We could maybe add sport in there again. Now, anyone on their own doesn't determine that you'd be a great trader. There's still many nuanced skills to learn but I think they can give you something useful that might just give you a little bit of a head start. Mm. And I think with the, the other thing with poker is obviously you're losing money as well. So it's almost exactly. identical. Your own money yeah, often. Yeah, exactly. So um, what about like, I mean, th- th- there's a sort of common, I suppose, issue with, with people coming into, into trading is that they know what to do. They've been taught what to do, but they don't seem to be able to do it. So there's that sort of gap between the two. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think, I think everyone who's traded can think of multiple times where in a given situation, you know, you know, you should stay in the winning trade or, you know, you know easy, you know, you should get out of a losing trade and for whatever reasons you don't. Uh, now there are some times when actually, and this is true for skilled traders where you wouldn't, do what you originally planned to do so you would flex and then it gets even more difficult because now you've got to work about when do i stick and when do i flex but for most people at the basic level uh, there can be a number of reasons why that gap exists so for some people the gap actually is just competence and knowledge so they 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 know what they want to do but actually that knowledge isn't well founded enough to really for them to kind of trust in or believe or act upon it so so there's not a high enough level of competence uh, to really act on it so, but let's assume once you've got some level of competence, you've got some level of strategy, which is, which is effective. Um, why are we not sticking to it? Often it's because there's some kind of change in our state when it comes to actually make the decision. So, you know, mentally or emotionally or physiologically, physically, um, our state is changing and therefore it makes it harder um, to do the behavior in the reality. 
Uh, and we see this all the time. You know, we see it in sport, you know, taking a penalty on the training ground is different to doing it in a World Cup final in front of 100,000 people in a stadium and whatever, 20, 30 million watching it on TV. So, you know, when we get these changes in our, in our physical, mental, emotional state, it does change, changes our perception of what we're seeing. It changes how we feel. Uh, it changes how we might then react. If we go into, uh, if we feel threatened and we go into fight flight response, that's going to change our reactivity and what we think we might want to do. Then we've got to layer into that things like ego, which can start to play a, a role. Um, so, that, you know, uh, our, our mindset, the thoughts that might show up in that moment, um, as well as emotions, so a whole number of forces can be applied that now make it more difficult. Um, and I think inexperienced traders, they learn to manage that more effectively um, and they're used to it. You know, if you have a, con- a, con- a constant stress, you can, by exposure and familiarity, become you know, conditioned to it. So it's often harder for newer traders. But also, you know, if you're taking huge amounts of risk, um, greater than you would feel comfortable with, then all of that response becomes increased, makes it even harder. If your risk is more moderate, if the consequences are lower, you're going to have less stuff showing up that you've got to kind of work with. So it's really, again, it's about acknowledging that it is going to be a part of the trading experience that quite often there are going to be times when you will know what to do, but for thoughts, emotions, sensations in the body, urges, impulses are going to show up. And you need a toolkit to be able to manage it when it shows up. Essentially, what you want to do is reduce how much stuff shows up. That's where you need a good process. You need to be competent. You need to manage your risk well. Kind of good, solid trading behavior is a bit like a funnel. So reduce what shows up and then be skillful in managing what shows up. And what a lot of people try and do is they want to get rid of or they want to avoid um, what shows up rather than try and almost like embrace it and work with it. And, and for many people, the attempts to avoid or control what shows up in these moments is more problematic than what shows up. Um, and that's often because people have been mis- misled, you know, things like, you know, trade without fear, these kind of things, um, which I personally don't believe is a, is a useful um, paradigm. I think people should embrace that, you know, anxiety and fear are going to be a part of the experience and then just learn to manage it. Um, so. And so, so what sort of example would you give to, to somebody you're coaching around trying to embrace this uh, thing that appeared at, at the wrong time? Yeah, well, well the, the thing for me that is there has to be a willingness. If you're going to go into trading, well, we'll do a metaphor first and we'll get back into trading. If I want to, to start, if I want to run a marathon, for example, it's 26.2 miles. And if I'm not, a, if I'm not you know, a trained runner, I've got to do the training to get to the point that I can run 26.2 miles. Then I've got to run the 26.2 miles. Now, anybody with any sense of what that takes will know that it's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot of dedication and commitment, and it's going to be massively uncomfortable and at times quite painful and miserable. So you've got to have a, a kind of a combination of commitment to want to do it and the willingness to embrace what comes with it. And that's the same in trading. You know, once you get into trading and you've been in it for a while and so you understand it a bit better, you have to have a point of real- realization which goes, this is how it is. You know, it, 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 I, I don't know many traders that like losing. That some, are, some are better at losing than others in terms of they can deal with it better. But I don't know many people that like it or want to do it. So stuff is showing up. Um, holding on to winning trades equally as difficult. You know, getting the sizing right, uh, pulling the trigger after a losing run. You know, all these things are quite challenging. You've just got to get better at them. Um, But if you try and avoid them, you can't get better at them. So the only way to get better at them is by doing them. So that's got to start with a commitment to, I'm going to put myself into these situations and I'm willing to do that. And almost like um, for lots of my clients, as part of their preparation, they'll do a piece where they'll go, okay, what am I willing to experience today? in order to trade at my best. And that'll be, okay, I need to be willing to um, have to maybe manage my ego. I'll have to be willing to manage the doubt that might show up when I want to put on a trade. I might have to be willing to um, deal with um, the fear of missing out that might show up today. So I think, you know, starting the trading session almost with a reminder that, okay, it's like an athlete, you know, if I'm going to do a hard run today, I would start off with, well, this is a, you know, five mile fast paced run at maximum heart rate close to it, it's going to be really painful. Do you know what? I'm willing to mm. experience that in the service of moving closer towards my goal and being the athlete I want to be. And I think traders need to have that same mentality. We, if we're willing 
to experience the discomforts that come with trading. We will put ourselves into those situations so we can learn how to cope with them, which is massively powerful. But also we start to change our relationship to what shows up. We start to change our relationship to the thoughts that show up, to the emotions, to the sensations in a way that enables us to actually manage it and navigate it more effectively and over time to be more consistent with what matters, which is the behaviors underneath all of that. Mm. Because it's the behavior that makes or loses you money. You've got to press the trigger or not press it. That's a behavior. The thought or the emotion doesn't make you or lose you any money. It's what you do while you're having the thought or the emotion. So that's what we need to learn how to manage. So uh, yeah, so commitment, willingness, some acceptance, and then just learning to manage, you know, some of the sort of the finer mm. techniques would be about how, how we manage the thoughts and emotions that show up. But you've got to be willing to accept it and embrace mm. it. You've cho- I, you know, to my class, I go, well, you've chosen this. No one's making you be a trader. You've chosen this profession and you knew, you knew it was going to be tough. Therefore, be willing to accept what comes with it. Embrace it. It's interesting. Yeah, it, it reminds me of what um, Tom was talking about when, and I'm pretty sure he talked about it on the show, about visualization around before going to a trading session. So like, you know, sit down, visualize this situation, you know, the trade's going against you, you're in drawdown, um, or you're on a, in a winner, you're holding on to the winner, you're keeping it and it goes against you and you take the break even, all these sort of things. Yeah. Do you, Is this something that you're a proponent of in, in terms of trying to get to the people to that point of embracing something as opposed in a quicker manner, as opposed to yeah. just having to go through the experience and, and you know, suck it up, which will take yeah, a yeah, longer, no, longer amount of time, I guess. I'm yeah, guessing. definitely. So definitely, yes. Um, so visualization and, or imagery, mental rehearsal, whatever people want to refer to it as, is very powerful because neurologically, the brain cannot recognize the difference between a kind of a mental simulation and a real experience. So at the neurological level, it's the same. Uh, and, and, the, and the way of kind of making sense of that is to think about a nightmare. When you have a nightmare, it's an imagined experience, but you could wake up sweating, feeling the sensations of fear, heart pounding and so on. So, so we can use imagery to our advantage in trading. And, and this is one of my, I guess, what, mental training practices in many ways, but it is useful in that way as, as Tom utilizes it, which and as I would do with my traders in terms of if we know the sorts of situations that we want to kind of be more willing to um, embrace and accept and work with, we can rehearse them. And what that does is we can speed up the process of exposure and skills training because it might be, let's say, for example, there's one situation a day where I kind of feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to get five practices a week, 20 over the course of a month. But via visualization, I could do five practices a day Mm. or 10 practices per day. I could get 50 done this week. So I can speed up because every time we visualize, as long as it's intentional and focused, we get a little dose of the physiology of the experience. So we, 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 get, we, we, we feel it in the body. It's visceral. And that it's a bit like an inoculation. It just gives us that little yeah. dose of it that we can start to inoculate ourselves against it. But we also get to rehearse the behavior we want to do whilst we're feeling it. So now neurologically, we're building the, mental, the neural pathway to enable us to do the behavior while we're having the feeling. The key thing about visualization is many people wrongly visualize um, being in a situation that's uncomfortable and they see themselves being icy, cool and calm and doing the behavior. And what happens then is in the reality, they're not icy, cool and calm and they don't do the behavior. Because what you need to visualize, you need to visualize it as it's going to be. So if I'm in a situation where, let's keep it simple, I need to take my stop loss at a certain level. I need to visualize the market moving against me. Price is coming down towards my stop loss. I need to visualize. I need to imagine what's going to be showing up in my mind. I need to imagine what's going to be, what I'm going to be feeling in the body. I need to make it real. I might then also practice how I'm going to cope with that so I can practice my coping skills in my visualization. And then it ends with me exiting the trade. But if I just visualize price moving down, everything's good. I'm not worried about it at all. I feel cool and calm and I I get out of my trade. That isn't the connection. I'm now practicing the wrong experience. It's not going to be that way. So we want and we want to rehearse the discomfort for um, realism and transference. But also because that's where we get this little dose of exposure. We get more familiar with the discomfort and we started to be get more comfortable with feeling uncomfortable 
And one, one trader I coached um, two years ago, a massive turning point for him um, was when he had this realization that, oh, discomfort is normal in trading. And I was like, perfectly normal. And he's like, I've been trying to avoid it for like seven years. <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. a good trader. Yeah. I mean, now he's a phenomenal trader. Yeah. But so, you know, just that realization, this is part of the experience in itself. Yeah. Perfectly normal. You know, if you've got a big position moving against you, that's going to feel uncomfortable. It shouldn't fit. Why would you be icy, cool and calm about it? It makes no sense. This is about understanding, you know, I'm a human in this situation. A lot of what shows up probably shows up for most people who are human and who are traders and therefore is probably normal. And I just need to work with it. Can't avoid it. You can't, well, you can avoid it. You can avoid it by not trading. Mm. That's how you avoid it. Yeah. Um, but that's not useful. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll go through a couple more um, things here before we wrap up. So what about the, the role of luck in trading? And I, I saw this in one of your videos and I didn't get around to watching it. So I'm interested to hear what you've got to say on that subject. Well, the, the formula for trading, as it is in, in any um, Probably most performance sports, I would say sport is a performance activity. Sport would be the same, poker is the same, is skill plus luck equals outcome. So when you get an outcome on a trade, you, you, know, you, you win or you lose, that is going to be a um, result of your skill um, plus um, any um, luck, which is um, Essentially, you know, events or circumstances which either kind of go in your way or go against you um, outside of your control, which are inherent in the markets. You know, randomness, um, you, you can't remove it. There's, there's luck in sport. There's luck in poker. There's, there's luck in trading. There's luck in life. And um, Annie Duke talks about this, I think, in her book, um, Thinking in Bets, where, you know, she says the only two things uh, that kind of determine how your life turns out are um, luck and the quality of your decisions and the, you only control one of those. And I would say that's completely the same. As she, well, she obviously got hers from poker, which is her background. And I would say that's the same for traders. The only things that we can control in trading is the quality of our decisions, which essentially I would say is what trading skill is. You know, so it's the process of making good quality decisions on a consistent basis under conditions of uncertainty. That's the skill. Then there's the luck, which is the variance, which will lead to the outcomes you get. And I think if we don't acknowledge that, then psychologically it's unhelpful because we might start to become overconfident that our results are purely down to us. And also, I think on the downside, we have to realize that sometimes, you know, you will get um, outcomes that you, that you don't want um, that are only a result of luck and variance and randomness. You know, and this is why in poker, you know, the variance is so high. There's a guy... Um, Russo and Shoemaker wrote a book called Winning Decisions. have this really nice little matrix, which essentially very simple is win and lose are the top two and then good process and bad process. So on that matrix, all decisions are I did a good process and I won or I lost or I did a bad process and it won or it lost. And the goal in trading and in poker is to do good process, but some will win and some will lose. And some will lose because there's variance. And in fact, um, a company called Essentia Analytics recently did some research with fund managers. And I think in that study, something like only 80, no, 18% of, of the people in the study were winning more than 50% of the time. And the most skilled, successful fund manager, who is a phenomenal performer, was winning 55% of the time. So that means 45% of the time he's having tradeways doing the right thing, but losing. So, and that's the role of, of luck, randomness, mm. outside factors, and so on. So we have to be mindful of that. And, and again, accept it, but we also have to be humble enough to accept it when we maybe are getting winning trades and appreciate that sometimes we're getting winning trades or winning runs. And then there's an element of, you know, um, luck, randomness that's playing a part in that as well. So we just have to acknowledge it. And then yeah, I think what yeah. it means is we have to understand then that that piece we do nothing about, but we've got to fully invest ourselves into what we can do, which is the skill piece, which is process of making good quality trading decisions under conditions of uncertainty on a consistent basis. Mm. And that's, you know, we, if we think about in sport, we can probably think about a sport and we know what the skill part of the sport is. 
But sometimes we don't define really what the skill of trading is. And if, but if we don't define what the skill is, then what do we go away to practice to get better at? You know, we've got to think about, you know, the practice of getting better at trading. So what is the skill? What are the elements of that? And then how do you go about improving them? Yeah, there's, there's actually a quote at the start of the show, which um, goes, the market's going to do what the market's going to do, which is essentially yeah. the luck component yeah. of what you're talking about. Um, yeah, exactly. it's, it's, un, it's the outside, you know, we, we, things that we can control, things that we can't control. Yeah. Yeah, you can't control what the market does, but you can control how skillfully you respond to what the market does. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it just reminds me of things like you know, the professional footballers or soccer players, depending on in the world you're part of the world you're in, who who managed to shoot this ridiculously unbelievable goal like uh, Zlatan against England like six seven years ago, where he did this weird bicycle kick. He's never going to do that again, but. It's all yeah down to the the skill added to the luck that it actually he actually pulled it off and yep. and you know and, and it happened um, and then golf was getting a hole in one they're always going you know they're always going for the hole but they don't always get a hole in one because it same sort of thing um, a lot of outside factors yeah exactly but again exactly. the more skillful you are I mean you can get beginner golfers who get a hole in one yeah in some of the early rounds and you get some pro golfers that have never had a hole in one yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, but we obviously know if we had to bet on one or the other to win a round of golf, we know who to put our money on. Yeah. If we have to bet on who's going to get a hole in one, we might bet on the pro because they're the pro. We expect them to get more. But the reality is, you know, a, a relatively, you know, as long as you can hit the ball far enough, even a beginner golfer could yeah. get that hole in one. Yeah. Or, or yeah, you know, yeah, or digressing here, but I mean, if you play a, a round of golf on on say a, a course that Tiger Woods has played on, and you know that he bogeyed a hole and you parred that hole, you in fact you would have beat Tiger on, on that hole. Yeah. Maybe not that day, but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. The other thing about so yeah, Cam, which I think is important, is this is also true for trading because a new trader, beginner trader, could like a beginner golfer get a hole in one. Yeah. Could get you know early in their trading experience with very little skill but with a huge amount of luck get some either a particularly big winning trade or a sequence of winning trades and that unfortunately can be um to turn into a horror story because we can start to um misplace you know kind of i guess we can um construe that as skill or knowledge when actually we just got very lucky uh, mm. and i've seen that a few times actually even in professional traders we've had kind of a, a good run of luck early in their careers and it has problems uh, further down the track so again we have to be mindful that um particularly for newer traders just because you are making money or you made money has some good trades it may not be down a reflection of your skill level um, in fact early on it's probably more you probably a little bit of skill and quite a bit of luck as you get better and better, there's probably a, a greater amount of skill at play and then luck's kind of, you know, creating mm. the variance on top of that. So um, I think that's quite important just to remind ourselves of. Okay, we're going to dive into like a, I suppose, a very niche element of trading mindset and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. So yep. how, how would you get somebody through managing um, problems with having a fear of missing out on getting into a trade, um, yep. taking trades and that sort of thing? It's an interesting one, FOMO. It's, um, so I think I, I think one of the things about fear of missing out is one we need to accept again that it is a part of the trade. In fact, it's part of life. You know, it's inbuilt into us in life. You know, if it's a Friday night and all your friends are going out and you don't really fancy it, but then you hear that everyone's going out and you're going to a certain venue. It's very hard then, even if you really want to stay in and have a quiet night in, it's really hard to stay at home knowing that everyone else is out. They, they might have a great time. They're going to talk about it over the weekend and you weren't there. So, you know, and, you know, being part of, the, of, a, of a community and, you know, um, and not being isolated is kind of all kind of ties into that. So it, we've got to accept that in human condition and in trading condition, it's there. And, and it's normal. It's not like some abnormal thing that happens to people. It, it's part of who we are. Um, so I think the first thing is accept the fact that it's part of the experience. And be willing to experience it as part of your trading. Secondly, it can be useful. So fear of missing out is a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit like a threat-based state because we've kind of got this fear, but it's a future fear. And so I think we need to counter that. You know, we need to kind of reframe it to try and manage the, the threat. And I think, you know, if we've got the belief, and I had this actually with a client last week who'd been working on this, and I think if we can come up with some kind of belief 
along the lines of, you know, the market will always give me another opportunity or something like that. If you genuinely believe, you can't just say it to yourself, but if you can say it with meaning based on experience because you've seen it and it's, and it's much more um, ingrained in you, if you genuinely believe that the market will always give you another opportunity, then I think, it, again, it takes off some of the pressure to have to be in the move in the moment, but also if you do miss out, it reduces the impact beyond that. So I think, you know, the, the acceptance is key. I think having at the mental level, some sort of mental framework that recognizes um, that you will get more opportunity. I think you also need to be very clear about what your trading process is to have clarity about what is a trading opportunity for me. Because sometimes FOMO comes from not just you worrying about missing out on your trade. It's, you know, other people are on a trade or, you know, obviously social media now, you know, you're, you're seeing things on social media. So it's nothing related to you, what you're, maybe not even the markets you trade. And I see this, you know, traders are jumping into markets they've never traded before. Nowhere is it written on their process, anything. Um, and that's where we need to be cautious is about being pulled away from our process, what we do well uh, and so on. So you know, being clear about that and being committed to that is also really important. And then in the moment, this is true for all emotions. You need to recognize emotions when they show up. So you need to be able to notice. And often emotions are a bit like ripples in a wet, uh, on, the, on the ocean. They start small and then they sort of start to build and build and build. So FOMO might start as a small thought and then it might become this kind of really powerful urge. So you need to be aware of, of the feeling. And one of the most useful techniques for dealing with emotions in trading is not to try and get rid of them or not to try not to feel them, but it's to notice them when you're having them and to label them. So you might notice that you're having FOMO and you might even say to yourself, oh, I'm noticing that I've got the fear of missing out here. Now, once we start to label and we start to name the experience we're having, it actually reduces the intensity of the emotion it gives us a bit of distance away from the emotion such that we're not as reactive mm. to it. And it allows us to maybe just consider our response um, before we either do or don't um, engage. So, so yes, yeah, so I think, you know, um, accept it, um, form some kind of belief that's useful around there's always more opportunities, be clear about the process. And then I think, you know, in the moment, it's just about being aware of what you're feeling and notice it, name it, label it, um, and then again, focusing on now I know how I'm feeling. What behavior do I want to take in this moment? You know, what's the effective behavior? That's it. That's a uh, such that the emotion's voice. not driving the behavior. You're having the emotion of fear of missing out. And at the same time, you're deciding what the effective behavior is within that context. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like labeling the emotion when you feel it come through, which I think a lot of people just, that's probably the biggest issue is the emotion comes through. And they never get to the point of knowing what to do with it. Even if they do notice it, they'll still let it just flow through and up. Oh, I'm now controlled by the emotion. Well, what a lot of people want to do is if it's, a, if it's an uncomfortable emotion, like a fear and anxiety and irritation and frustration is, they don't want to feel it. So when they notice it, they don't want to feel it and they'll try and get rid of it in some way. And that's for, you know, for example, um, if you've got the fear of missing out and it's uncomfortable, people will jump into the trading opportunity because then by jumping into the market in the short term, the fear of missing out goes away. So now in the short term, you feel more comfortable, but you might end up now with a worse trade than you, than you would have had otherwise. So in the long term, there's a consequence. Yeah. So there's often a payoff in trading when it gets uncomfortable between I can choose to feel more comfortable now in the short term by doing this behavior, by not taking my stop loss. So now I'm not in a losing, you know, I haven't, um, taken the loss so that feels more comfortable but the market goes against me and then further down the line I feel more uncomfortable yeah. or I can take the stop loss now or I cannot get into the trade now with my FOMO which in the short term is more uncomfortable but in the long term uh, makes me more profitable and I think there's a for, for a lot of people they have to ask themselves the question am I trading to be comfortable or am I trading to be profitable and the reality is if you're trading to maximize profits, you also probably need to be willing to be uncomfortable 
uh, more of the time than you might normally like to be. And that's kind of the payoff, um, as it is in many things that are worthwhile doing. So, but the, but the labeling of emotions came from a guy called Matt Lieberman at UCLA. He actually put people into brain scanning machines, fMRI machines, and looked at what happens in people's brains when you try to resist an emotion, suppress it, or when you, when you acknowledge it and, and label it, naming it. And when you try and suppress an emotion, a bit like holding a beach ball under the water, it takes effort. And of course, if you let go of the ball, and he found that in the brain, they were seeing increased neural activity in the emotional circuits when people were suppressing. When people acknowledged how they were feeling, there was a reduction in intensity, a bit like a messenger coming into the door. I take the message. Thanks very much. Message delivered. That's a nice, calm process, as opposed to messenger coming my way. I don't want to receive that message. I shut the door in your face. They want to give me the message. They push the door open. And now we're struggling together. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of traders spend a lot of time struggling with their emotions rather than going, open the door. What's the message? Thanks very much. Okay, now what do I want to do? Awesome. Brilliant. And that's where I try and get my traders to. You know, it's working with the emotions and not struggling with them. It's awesome. Well, look, on, on that fantastic little tidbit there at the very end, um, what's the best way for traders to get hold of you? Uh, professional traders, institutional traders, uh, performance edge, consulting.co.uk. Um, if you're retail trader based, then trade at your best.com. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, look, guys, um, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to Steve's, uh, uh, sites there so steve thank you once again for coming on everyone do remember um hit subscribe hit like click on that notifications bell and click all and we'll see you in the next video video or podcast Radio folks, there you have it, the 200th episode of Trading Nut, done and dusted. So uh, guys, if you do want to go and check out that video we shot with Lewis Kelly, uh, it's well, it's not a video we shot, he did a, a live stream, we've cut out the best bits of it, piece it together, because it is a great little bit of educational content out there to understand smart money uh, trading and what they do uh, to influence price and how you can benefit from it so go and check that out on the channel there uh, other things to remember we've got the scalping challenge so if you scalp the london open you want to come on the trading nut channel then this is your chance hit me up at support at trading and to the other things we've got is the robot lab live we're basically into the in the process of putting that on a demo account um, we've got a portfolio that looks pretty good we're going to chuck that up and see if we can confirm whether or not we decide to go on a prop trading firm challenge with that bot so go and check that out over there and if you're looking to automate anything that you do then check out the robot builders club you get the robot lab live with that and i'd love to see you in there all right folks enough from me Uh, we'll see you in the next episode